I have the great pleasure and honor to introduce Heather Booth this afternoon. I first met Heather two years ago at the Democracy Spring Campaign in Washington, D.C. She was sitting on the sideline chatting with some folks, and every so often one of the leaders of the campaign would walk over and have a short conversation. She looked like an interesting person, so I approached her and we talked a bit about organizing elders. Only after did I learn about her very impressive history of organizing. Heather, like most of us, is an elder, having grown up in the 50s and becoming an activist in the 60s. I'm not going to try and give you a full biography because we are fortunate to have a wonderful short film that will do just that. It's the trailer to the recent re recently released movie, Heather Booth, Changing the World, a film by Lily Rivlin. We promise to send you a link to the website in a follow-up email so you can see where future screenings are listed. But for now, let's look at this trailer and get to know Heather a little more. And if you are on phone at some future time, you can also access the trailer. You have to go through life with more than just passion for change. You need a strategy. And your plan better include voting. You see, change requires more than righteous anger. It requires a program and it requires organizing. They said to me, Elizabeth, if you really want to push for this consumer agency, you got to get organized. And I said, great, how? They said, I've got two words for you, Heather Booth. I view my role as an organizer. To be an organizer, you have to love people and hate injustice. I was one of a number of Northern students that went down to do voter registration. We saw the value of working for a goal that was much larger than ourselves. We saw he really could create change, change people's lives, change the reality by taking action. What makes you think you stand a chance up against those kind of forces? <laughs> well, first of all, it's a David and Goliath fight. We should remember that sometimes David wins. <laughs> The, the threshold belief of organizers is that it is grassroots, ordinary people putting pressure on elected officials at all levels that is the key ingredient for changing policy. It's not a theoretical thing. It's teaching the, the practices and principles and then making sure people then go out and do it. Before Heather, we didn't have a way to teach strategy. If you look at significant times in the movement, Heather is there someplace. I mean, it's like Zelig. I took the challenge seriously. I set up a training center called Midwest Academy. So what is a strategy? The way I look at a strategy is a strategy of... I said, it'll never work. You can't teach organizing. And she said, well, why don't you come out here and see what we're doing? So I did and, and discovered that it did work. Much to my surprise. Imagine a world if you're a single mother, you don't live in poverty. Imagine a world where if you're a young black man, you're not racially profiled by the police. That world is only possible if we organize, and only if we organize. And the bell has sounded, bringing to a close an extraordinary day on Wall Street. They were spending literally more than a million dollars a day to lobby against the financial reforms and principally the consumer agency. Heather got our groups together and just kept growing. The number of groups kept showing them what was possible. The question now isn't, are you willing to die for freedom? It's also, will you live for freedom and build organization and support movements that will make change? So now, am I on? You are. Now I say, welcome to the resistance. <laughs> we are part of the resistance. We are an important voice of the resistance. We are the voice of elders. We bring commitment, experience, insight. We have connections. 
and we also have a will and a willingness to pass this on to future generations, to learn from the past, live in the present, and move it on to the future. Sometimes I bring these pictures with me wherever I go. This is Henry, my eldest grandson. Sophie, my middle, my second granddaughter. Max, and this is Oscar and Hazel. You each have your own pictures, your own stories, whether you have children or grandchildren or none, but in fact, the world becomes part of your children. We are moving this movement on for another generation and we need to. And it's beyond resistance. It's in to organizing, to pulling people together, both one by one, but group by group, having our numbers magnify and moving on to a winning plan, which are some of the elements I'll talk about in the next 20 minutes or so. I did really want to thank Lynn for uh, inviting me on. She provides such a visionary leadership with such a positive spirit that's just infectious. And John has been incredibly helpful and generous with his time uh, helping me understand both the network and how we can move forward together. And then Jen and Laurel, in, in many ways, made this possible by telling me who's not very adept at technology, uh, how, we, how we can get on and move forward. It's particularly important now because there's some ways, and this is a, this is a more perilous and potentially inspiring time than any time I've had in my entire lifetime. It's perilous, we know this every day. I almost feel it's like whiplash. Is it one thing hitting us or another thing hitting us? Last night I was down at the Supreme Court. I live in Washington, DC. It was a frightening turnout and an inspiring one. Frightening because the opposition was there with a level of antagonism and even potential violence that I was fearful of. And then we have this threat this appointment to the Supreme Court that will in fact undermine healthcare, undermine the potential for uh, continuing uh, supporting people who have uh, pre-existing conditions. It will undermine women's right to decide when or whether to have a child. It will undermine in the environment. It will undermine democracy itself because this Kavanaugh is a uh, nominee who uh, doesn't believe that the president can ever be prosecuted or held accountable. Not really. We see it's a perilous time a few weekends ago with the families ripped apart. I hope many of you were out there with those immigration demonstrations. It's a perilous time. Democracy itself is at stake. But it's also inspiring. And for each of these perils, the voice of seniors, of elders, is crucially important to bring this message to the public and to recruit future generations and to recruit more of us who, if we are lucky, knock on wood, are increasing in numbers. Mm -hmm. It's been inspiring because we also see the resistances all around, the Women's March, the immigration demonstrations, the Parkland students, Scott Pruitt, we got rid of him. The environmental, uh, your environmental work, it worked. The first candidate, the first cabinet member, we got rid of him because people organized, but only because people organized. I wanted to give one short story of an early time when I was organizing and uh, draw some lessons from it, and then apply that just briefly to some of the incredible work that you're starting to do now and that is so promising for what you'll be doing in the future. And then we'll open it up to questions, comments, and your thoughts. In 1964, I joined in with many other uh, Northern students to support a Southern civil rights movement in Mississippi. In Mississippi in 1964, black lives did not matter. And poor black people lived in a state of terror, not allowed to vote, barely about allowed to live and speak their true feelings without intimidation and threat. And so they looked for, there was internal organizing of the people affected in Mississippi that was remarkable organizing, people taking courageous action. But they needed more power. We need more power in organizing. And so they looked to Northern students to come down and bring the power that we had through often our parents who might have other connections, 
uh, relationships with members of Congress or didn't have them before, but would have them just as you're doing with your network, building those relationships. And then implying that we would have the support as future votes. So we came down to Mississippi. Many of you know about the summer project. Many of you, some of you may have been there or supported it because it gained notoriety when three, uh, two of the Northern volunteers and one of the Southern volunteers were murdered at the hands of the Klan. For those who, who can see on um, the, the video, this is a picture of the FBI poster of Andrew Goodman, James Cheney, and Michael Schwerner, three young volunteers who were picked up by the Klan. What you may not know is that while they were looking for the bodies of those three young men, they found the bodies of other black men, many whose hands were bound or feet were chopped off, one thrown in the Tallahatchie River, the Pearl River. And when they found those bodies, they weren't investigated because black lives did not matter. When the disappearances happened, they weren't even reported because people lived in such intimidation. And yet, because there was organizing in the streets, in Congress, in the media, because there was the threat of the votes that would happen, because our numbers increased, because it wasn't just one group, but we formed alliances. Because of that, within a year, there was a Voting Rights Act. Mississippi now has more African-American elected officials than any other state in the country. And the mayor of Jackson, Mississippi, Ishakwe Lumumba, who himself says he has the most radical progressive city in the United States. This, by the way, is a, is a second picture. Uh, this is, uh, I'm in Shaw, Mississippi. We're doing a voter registration drive. And it wasn't civil disobedience, we were doing a voter registration drive, but this is just moments before I was arrested in my first arrest, which was their attempt to prevent us from voting and registering people. But we changed the world because we took action. This is a picture, and Lynn is the one who actually made me think of telling this little story just a few minutes ago. This is me. Can, can you see the picture, by the way, on my screen? I don't see it. Can you see it? Yes. 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 Great. Uh, this is, I'm 18 years old playing the guitar, and this is Fanny Lou Hamer. Many of you may have heard her, and these are two of her friends outside of her house in Rollville. Um, she was a great uh, heroic leader of uh, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Now we have a long way to go. Here's a picture from Black Lives Matter, Freddie Gray, and, and others, some whose names we still don't know. We have a long way to go in many levels. But we make progress when we organize. And I believe we only make it for the majority of the people in a way that will stick when we organize. And the only way to win is by standing up and fighting back. And that's what you're doing. It's why I'm so glad to be with you uh, on this call. I wanted to draw from that story some different kinds of lessons about organizing and see if it can apply to the incredibly uh, uh, energizing work that you're doing, that you're starting now and that will grow uh, into the future. The first is just to underscore um, sort of essentials of organizing. One is that it starts with the values. It has to start with, I actually believe it has to start with love in our hearts, love at the center to an extent for ourselves, but for others. As I said in that video clip, we have, to, uh, we have to love people and hate injustice. It starts with values and we talk about the values we care about, about hope, about caring, about democracy, about freedom, about justice. And two, we have to tie it to people's lives and build a relationship with them. This isn't about us. It's more about listening rather than just talking. We want someone recruited to us. Yes, we need to say very briefly what we're interested in, but first we have to know what's their story? What do they care about? They're an elder now. What was their life like before? What's it like now? What will it be like? What could it be like if we join together? What do they care about? Oh, that's something we're working on already. Oh, we're not working on that now, but maybe we could. Do you have others who are interested? How could we build a group working on that issue? 
it's building the relationship, caring about them. They don't come to a meeting and our first comment isn't, well, where the hell were you? It may be, you didn't come, are you okay? And they may have been sick or a friend may have died or they may have said, the meetings are boring, I'm not coming. Whatever it is, we need to listen and hear what's going on with them and show we care. The third fundamental is we need to understand what their interests are and speak to their interests. Now, some of this means it's not just a general abstraction of the values, freedom, justice, democracy, the environment. It's a specific. One example I was organizing on, um, and actually someone was organizing me on an environmental issue. And I was at home, I was doing the dishes. I get a phone call. I've got two little kids running around. We just had dinner. I've got a meeting coming to my house at night, probably a story that happens in your houses frequently. And I'm on the phone, someone says, will you come down and do phone banking? And I say, I just can't. And say, well, we're working, on, we're, we're working on the environment. Why don't you come down? We're working on the environment. And I said, I can't. And the person said to me, oh, you're just too apathetic. What I realized is apathy is when someone else doesn't do what you want them to do. They want to do what they want to do. Now, when I also found out they were working on to prevent a kind of pollution from smokestacks that would create asthma, and I had a child who was rushed to the hospital almost every winter with asthmatic attacks, and I feared for his life, I was there and first in line. But they spoke to the interest that I had in the terms that I spoke about it and cared about it. Beyond that, there are three principles of direct action organizing I want to share with you and then see if we can apply it to some of the uh, work that you're doing now. Then we'll open it up. Um, there are three key principles of what I call direct action organizing. There are many other principles people can outline in organizing. These aren't the only ones, but I think they're particularly important now. Based on our values, number one, we try to actually win. It's not enough just to protest. I said, I think this is beyond resistance. It's resistance to organizing, to elections. And then we repeat and repeat and repeat again. So it's organizing around concrete victories that will impact people's lives, more money in their pocket, air they can breathe. Um, uh, being able to vote, being able to sit where they want to sit, go to school where they want to go to school. A concrete improvement, as well as the vision and values. The second is to give them a sense of their own power. Advocacy is where we talk for other people. Part of what I think you're doing is trying to give seniors, elders, a voice for ourselves. And that means we need to recruit more people into it. And so how do we design the activity so they're the ones who speak? We prepare them, we work with them, we help them write what they were gonna say. We help practice it with them and support them. So someone who feels like, oh, you're a great speaker, I'll just sit here. Well, maybe they should be the person on the agenda, but they need support to do that. And it's for them to raise their voice. And then the third is to change the relations of power. It's a power shift. And to do that power shift, we also need to build organization, increase our numbers, and hold those in power accountable. Um, you really have the experience, the commitment, the connections, the insight, the values. You also have a special story you can tell. And every elder has a story they can tell. Why are they doing it? Who are they doing it for? They don't have to be the world's expert on the issue. We need some people who are experts and we can call them in and some of you may be those very experts. But what we all have is a story and we can learn to tell our story about how we're all united and how we can make change when we organize. I see you're now doing this pledge uh, John and both, uh, and also uh, Jen described to me the 
the pledge that you're doing. Some of it, my printed copy may not be so clear, but I, this is what the uh, uh, climate, uh, the elders climate action is doing. And I know there are groups, uh, people on the phone, on the uh, call webinar now who are working on a broader array of issues and my heart's with you too. But one thought, just to take a concrete example, I love this petition, this pledge. It's to get candidates to sign up. First of all, it's an action. You recruit people to a discussion. I used to joke, you get disgusting people. Oh, I mean, discussing people. You get the kind of people who want to do the events you're recruiting them to. You get people to do actions. You recruit, you create activists and recruit activists, people who want to take action and feel there's an urgency. I love that, it's a petition. You not only are using this to drive the issue of uh, environment in this election, which is great, you're also using it to build a relationship with that elected official or the candidate running for office. And then once in office, we sustain that relationship. You could call them, find out which staff you're supposed to talk to every week, give them an update, ask them for an update. But then there are some things I'd throw out from the previous points I made that may be things worth thinking about how to add on to what you're doing. Or you may already be doing this and I just wasn't informed about it. So maybe I'm just reinforcing the good practices you have. One is in addition to the general issue of a pledge on the environment to consider, is there a specific win you can have? because now people have more or less declared where they are on the environment. It's not an issue like, are you for or against Kavanaugh? That would be a specific, and you can do it on the environment or on other issues. Uh, when I was at the Supreme Court last night, uh, there were people up there with signs from League of Conservation Voters and uh, uh, Friends of the Earth has been in touch with me today and other groups. Everyone will come in because Kavanaugh is so uh, extreme and uh, elite on every issue. He's gonna be bad. For every, he's an, he's an all-purpose uh, opposition. <laughs> but is, so is there something on the petition, after you do the petition, and the petition is great, that you can then tie it to some other particular action you're pushing? It may be stopping Kavanaugh. You could join that too, because you care about climate, or if climate's not your main focus, because you care about people or any other issue but to have something that you can mark, did we win, did we get close, how did we build, so people feel the urgency on it, and it's concrete in their lives. And then you talk about it, not just for the values, which is very important, but for what it means to people's lives. If, you, if Kavanaugh is in, it will mean that people with a pre-existing condition, I have thyroid cancer, I could not be covered. The truth is I'm a woman, that's a pre-existing condition. We can't get covered. And so how does it affect us? Then you also want to building relationships to recruit others. Can you set goals for how many people you can recruit? Where would you find them? How would we listen to them? Can we do little webinar trainings on recruitment? What's worked for one group? What could work for another? And then even not just going it alone, because like the poor people in Mississippi, it was crucially important they were organized, but you win when you organize your own base and you say, who are the allies that need, we need to pull in? And so students from the North came in, their parents came in. And are there other coalitional allies in which you have the elders voice? I'm not sure there's another environmental group for those working on the environment. And I know there's some focused on the environment, some focused on other issues, but they're not enough groups with an elders voice in it but you don't have to be alone. So you could be the elder's voice in the effort. Let's say it's Kavanaugh and you're speaking for the elders about Kavanaugh. That's an important message and possibly could get picked up because it's a more unique message and one that needs to be heard and could relate to people in a different way. And you need to build your numbers. We all start out small and we build with a unique, we know what our unique contribution is, but we see how our Numbers will grow by recruitment, by adding on in coalition partners, and adding on both with our actions in our own names and our actions with other names, but with our particular role and identity. 
and then to consider what would you do with these petitions, these pledges, after the election. You probably have a plan, but not having heard it, I'll just uh, encourage you to think, so where does it go? Any action you need to know, and what do you tell people is the next action? Where do we meet again? How do we carry this on? And then do we have meetings with those members who are elected? Do we remind them what we did to help elect them? Do we ask them to come to our community? Do we ask them to carry a particular piece of legislation or if they're for the legislation to recruit others to also support it? So overall, again, I end to open up for your comments where I started, which was we do need to resist. And by the way, I carry my, my pussy hat with me wherever I go. This is my little pussy hat. I am for the resistance. I'm, I always want to be ready. But it's not enough to resist. We need to organize and we need to plan so we can win because we care about those future generations. And so we resist, we organize, we elect, and we do it even after they said no. And then we celebrate our victories together. Thank you all. So? So your comments, your questions, your thoughts. Okay. Thank you, Heather, very much. Um, I want to remind people, you can hear me, right? Shake your head if you can hear me. Thank you. I want to remind people they can use the chat box on, by clicking on chat at the bottom and typing in on the sides that this is an opportunity to ask Heather questions. And I have a question from Heather right now from Bob Krieger that says, this is so inspiring. Elders are the vast majority of Citizen Climate Lobby's 90,000 supporters. And I think that that's true. I uh, wonder if you have anything to say about that. Oh, and the question I have in relation to that, Heather, is there a value in trying to get the elders within an organization like CCL or 350.org to organize within the organization itself? And if so, how would you suggest? Well, um, if an organization is a partner organization in the movement, I always start by talking to the people who are the elected and the recognized representatives of the organization. Is this something they would like to see? And not just for us to say, this is what I think you should do. <laughs> the two of you should spend your time, your money. You should take on it. What can we do? So if you're saying, you know, we would like to see an elder, we think it would be helpful to have an elders and youth voice together with 350.org. 350 particularly, because it's such an online mm. organization. Many of them are uh, quite young, mm -hmm. in my experience. Um, would it be interesting for us to do an elders and youth action together? What would it be? We would think it's fun to, I don't know, right. whatever, whatever you thought would be fun. Right. I was going to give some examples, but I don't think it <laughs> worked for this. And then what would the youth think was fun? Or maybe they'll say, you know, we just don't have time for it. We're doing something else. Mm -hmm. And we see if it's helpful. And then they're having an action. And you might say, you know, we'd be glad to join in with you. And we have someone who we think provides a particularly important statement. What if we come with a picture, a blown up picture of our grandchildren? Mm. It's just one idea, as you can tell, yeah. I, I like that idea, but there, there are many ideas, and say, I'm doing this for Max, mm -hmm. and I'm doing it for all the children of the future generation. You can see how powerful telling children's stories were with the immigrant children, but it's powerful because people particularly care about children and care about the genuine way in which we care about the future, whether we have children or not. Thank but you, you have to know, Lynn, you do, and I know you know this, but we need to be able to say, 
this is what we bring. Mm -hmm. And this is what we think would be interesting. Or we've heard you're doing this. Mm -hmm. Here's how we think we might fit in and support your work and have our unique voice. Great. Thank you. That's a really good thing for us to listen to. Um, I want to move on to a question from Leslie, because I know that this is important to her. When the issue has more consequences in the future than it does today, like climate change, are there specific ways we can connect to people's interests so that they can feel motivated to take action? Sure. I mean, I mean, I don't know enough about it, but all these stories about Thailand now going on, with mm -hmm. monsoon rains flooding the cave. These 12 boys were almost drowned. The heroic rex rescue. I don't know if that reflects a fact of climate change, an mm -hmm. aspect, but with the floods, with the fires, with the destruction of people's lives and property, um, with the shrimp boats that aren't able to have a livelihood because uh, they're, they're the shrimp are dying because of climate change, uh, of, cli of global warming, or some say global scorching. Um, by the way, forgive me, my, sorry, my, my uh, phone is ringing. But, um, and so I think that we both have the values-oriented effort, yeah. and we certainly fight on climate change, mm -hmm. but I also think we need to find ways if we're not just getting the already convinced, mm -hmm. how does this tie into your life? Mm -hmm. You know, you, you want to go to the national parks. They're now turning them over to private industry. It's not a climate change issue, but it's related. What, they're, they're, uh, and these are things that, would care, that people would care about particular areas. And I gave the example about asthma, right. uh, my, which is a true story. Right. I'll add to that and say when I was organizing for um, some environmental issues right here in Philadelphia, and we were trying to get the unions to, to join with us, and I'm talking with union members, it was easy to talk about the rate of asthma in Philadelphia, which is incredibly high, and suddenly it wasn't an environmental issue, it was our children's health issue, and then tie it back into asthma. So, uh, And very, there also may be some groups that are more... Um, open than others. Mm -hmm. We have to make sure that we're talking to the people who are most likely to want to respond. Right. And there really are three kinds of people that you think about recruiting when you're building an organization. There are those who are your base, people who are for you if they just were motivated to do something. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons we did so poorly in the last election, oh, actually, you know, I know this is a nonpartisan group, but there were three million more votes for an alternate candidate, just to say that. But one of the reasons we didn't, the, we have this terrible outcome of this election, the last presidential election, was that people who would have been for what we are for, we did not work with them. It's on us. When organizing doesn't work, I take responsibility. I look at what could we have done. We did not engage in those communities in a ways that were credible and caring and showed and meaningful. And so people who were in effect for us didn't come out. So that's one group. The second are people who are not sure. Maybe they, were f they might be for you, they might not be for you. They're undecided and so they need persuasion and so we have to particularly understand what are their concerns. Both kinds of folks, we need to know their concerns, but it's somewhat different approaches. And then there are people who are opposed to you. And my view is when I'm doing recruitment, if someone is just opposed, I move on to the next. Life is short. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, here's another question for you. Is it important to figure out what happened to bring us to where we are now, or just keep moving forward? Can we learn from this, or is it just, wait, or is that wasted energy and recriminations? I think it's very important. We spent a lot of time figuring out, uh, I mean, I 
I spent, I, many of you probably spent a lot of time figuring out, I can give a short version now, but I do think it's important that based on what we know we didn't do right, we made mistakes collectively, and then to move on, but to move on right now with a great force. There's like, what, 130 something days till the election. Mm -hmm. And we need, each one is precious. Um, the big mistakes that I think were done, and this is more in terms of the presidential election, if that's the, there may be other things you're referring to. Uh, one is, I think that we, um, well, I liked the message we had, the message that uh, Donald Trump had, and this even for a nonpartisan group, you can do a fair analysis of what happened in the past. Donald Trump's message was, remem was memorable, make America great. Yeah. And he spoke about the economic lives of people and particularly what it meant to hard scrabble working people. And a lot of people found it persuasive because their lives weren't getting better. Our closing message was the children are watching. The truth is, I like that message. But the last ad that I was working very heavily on a big operation in Florida, and the last closing ad that Trump had, I loved his closing ad. I wished it had been ours. Mm. It was about the lives of real people. Mm -hmm. I thought we had a good message, but their message beat ours. Mm. We were winning until the last 10 days. So the question is then a number of things happened in the last 10 days or some things we couldn't control like the Russians and Comey and who, who else, whatever knows what happened, the bots. But the things we could control, one was the message. One is we either didn't know math or we didn't know geography. There's Michigan. <laughs> you know, there, there are a set of states we just didn't, we collectively didn't work in intensively. Mm -hmm. Now there's some states we worked in intensively and didn't win. I worked intensively in Florida, we didn't win. We didn't have a persuasion program. We only had a get out the vote program. Mm -hmm. And I think those three things together are substantial enough. I think there are other technical things that didn't happen. Um, and I think many people are learning now. And in part, your own organization is learning. You're doing this, uh, and uh, as John described, you were doing this pledge so that you are engaging in the election, even in a nonpartisan fashion. Mm -hmm. Elections matter. Okay, thank you. A question from Francis Stewart. I've been impressed with the work young people from March for Our Lives have been doing on their tour and talking with people who are opposed to them at their events. Is there a lesson there for us? Um, I'm for all sorts of conversation. I'm for doing a fast assessment. Is this conversation going to have an impact? But remember, the impact may be on the person you're speaking with. Mm -hmm. And I didn't say speaking to, but speaking with. Remember, listening more important than the talking. And you're also talking to a broader audience. So though I'm talking to one person, uh, talking with one person, I'm also talking all the people around that are seeing it. And if you're actually in the media, you're talking to the public. And by the way, when we talk, <laughs> repetition is our friend. Uh, by the way, have I mentioned repetition <laughs> is our friend? Uh, did I tell you that repetition is our friend? And now when I ask you, uh, who is our friend? Okay. McDonald's says it takes seeing a McDonald's ad seven times before you recall that you saw it. Hmm. You may not even then remember what it said. You know, sometimes you see on TV, there's one ad and then the same ad. It's not a mistake. We need to be as disciplined. We need to have a message that says what we mean, values-based, connecting with people in their real lives, and repeat, and repeat, and repeat, and then tie it in with true stories that magnify it and say what we care about. The message on Kavanaugh, by the way, is that he is an extremist who believes the president is against the, is above the law, will destroy healthcare, 
and will undermine women's right to choice. There are many other things we can say, but those are the three prime points to make in every message about Kavanaugh. And each issue should have its main points as you work on your petition, as you work on whatever other concerns you have. Thank you, that's very helpful. So I'm gonna ask you a question that John has sent in, and I think that you might have answered part of it, but because you believe that repetition is so important, I'm gonna <laughs> give you the opportunity to see if this is, can we really get it? For us to get really good at what you describe, how would you begin as an organization or as individuals? What kind and amount of training would be typically required? How do we get good at this? You know, partly you're doing it. That's why you're doing this webinar. Right. So my, my bet is that you know a great deal of it and much of organizing, I actually believe, is the obvious made explicit. But if you don't make it explicit, you often forget steps or not everyone's on the same page. There are a number of places to go for training. There's a training academy I started. I no longer really do much of the training, but it's, I think it's terrific. It's called Midwest Academy. Here's the organizing manual for Midwest Academy. It's called Organize, Organizing for Social Change. There are three authors, Kim Bobo, Jackie Kendall, and Steve Max. Um, I actually, there, there are progressive bookstores that sell it but also I, I buy it in bulk from Amazon, so they sell everything. <laughs> By the way, I saw an incredible movie, a very disturbing one called um, Sorry to Bother You, uh, about how there are groups like Amazon taking over the world. Anyway, light issue. But, um, so there is uh, organizer training. Um, one of the particular things, and then there, you can outline the things you want to learn. There's both um, history, politics, um, there's also uh, the vision of organizing. What, what, what are we for? There's techniques. How do you do recruitment? How do you do messaging? How do you do a direct action? Mm -hmm. How do you do an accountability session on a member of Congress? There's also strategic planning. And one of the things Midwest Academy teaches, and probably I don't know that there are other places that teach this as effectively as Midwest Academy. But I think the training overall is great. This is a strategic planning chart. And um, it's in the book, Organizing for Social Change. It's, I mean, you could have a webinar on how you do strategic planning. Um, but it's how you create a plan of action so that you don't just think tactically. Oh, let's all do hands around the Capitol. Oh, let's all, uh, you know, tonight for civil disobedience. I'm all for that, as I told you. I've got my pussy hat. I was down at the Supreme Court last night. You mostly can count on me. However, it's much preferable to also have a plan of action. How does that action fit into what comes next and what comes next and where do we go until we win? Great. All right. Um, so would you suggest that we should buy that manual and even look at it ourselves? In addition yeah, I think to maybe should, I think you can get the training? manual. I mean, there may be other things too, and people in your own group, you may have other suggestions of things that are effective. I'm not just trying uh -huh. to talk yeah, my no, no, no. Right. But also, the academy has training. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a cost for it, but they can do either, you can either come to its training as an individual, or they can design a training for your group. The academy's done large scale training for the leadership and uh, staff of groups like NAACP, Planned Parenthood, right. um, National Council of La Raza, uh, I really, hundreds, uh, Sierra Club uses its training uh, and it adapts it to its own organization then. But you, uh, the, the uh, academy, the website is uh, midwestacademy.com.org is a Christian academy when they were giving out the website name, so. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Let's try one more question here. Okay, 
what are the guidelines we should follow when picking allies to work with on a given issue? Well, um, it depends on what you want to achieve. Mm -hmm. Right now I'm working with a group on um, seeing if we can create a campaign on affordable medicine. People, 80% of the cost of the increase of medical prices uh, is the cost of prescription drugs. Right. And there's some horror stories. Uh, there's an AIDS drug that costs $1 to produce and is $1,000 to buy one pill. Uh, they, during the course of a conference I just went to, they would routinely, or not routinely, but several times said, another person has died because the price of insulin is so high, they were cutting their insulin intake. It doesn't have to be this way. There are things simple, there, there really are simple solutions we could have. Um, and so looking at who we would need to win, not just to protest. Mm -hmm. I said, I was asked what I work on it. I said, I'd only work on it if there really was a winning plan. Mm -hmm. We won't win, quite honestly, until there's a Democratic House and Senate. Uh, I think we could win without a Democratic president if we had the House and Senate. So it's going to be, this is a long-term process, but I think we could get it through the House uh, after the next election. I even think we can have some, it's conceivable we could have bipartisan support because the need is so great. Think of the opioid epidemic. Uh, and I also think we can have even, uh, I think, well, pharma is the big enemy. I actually think we can uh, siphon off um, some other people who might have been our opposition on other healthcare related issues, corporate interests and others, because I want to win. And so that coalition, I want everyone in. And so I've just made a list today of groups wide ranging spectrum and who would go see them what's the most persuasive argument listening to what are their concerns what would they work on oh one will work on this only if they work on also medicare for all oh one will work on it if they don't work on medicare for all how do we square that circle what could we work on together what could you work on apart we have to figure it out so it depends on what your goals are mm -hmm. sometimes it's wise to work with groups that you have the greatest affinity with so that you're not going to a group with you saying, you know, are you coming from Mars? At least you know them, there's a relationship and you wanna build that relationship. Uh, let's say this, um, this Supreme Court fight is growing. It started, there's a group called Demand Justice and there were about seven groups at the start. Um, Planned Parenthood, NARAL, uh, Indivisible, Move On. Um, they're about, seven groups, I don't remember all the names of the groups. And, but it was small, maybe there were even just five at the start because they knew each other, they had worked together before, they were comfortable in putting something together. And then they put out the call to everyone. Mm -hmm. And now there are uh, probably thousands of groups. Yesterday, right. you probably did too, I got, every organization was right. saying, I'm doing my briefing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's great. So you have to then find a way to coordinate all the work together. It depends on what you want to achieve uh, and what you have a capacity to do right. and what you're comfortable in doing or have the courage to do if it's not in your comfort zone. Yeah. Courage. I, Heather, I know we're ending up. I wanted to end with just one quote. Is that okay? Sure. Absolutely. I brought a quote. Um, this is from Howard Zinn, someone of our generation who you may know. He was a, uh, a teacher. Uh, in the civil rights movement. Many of his students joined the civil rights movement in protest as he did. And he wrote a book, uh, he wrote many books, uh, but was a historian uh, with a people's history of this country. Uh, this is uh, two and a half paragraphs, so. Okay. There's a power that can be created out of pent up indignation, courage, and the inspiration of a common cause. And if enough people put their minds and bodies into that cause, they can win. It's a phenomenon recorded again and again in the history of popular movements against injustice all over the world. Not to believe in the possibility of dramatic change is to forget that things have changed. Not enough, of course, but enough to show what's possible. We've been surprised before in history. We can be surprised again. In fact, we can do the surprising. The reward for participating in a movement for social justice is not just the prospect of future victory. 
It's the exhilaration of standing together with other people, taking risks together, enjoying small triumphs and enduring disheartening setbacks together. Note how often we've been surprised by the sudden emergence of a people's movement, the sudden overthrow of a tyranny, the sudden coming to life of a flame we thought extinguished. We're surprised because we haven't taken notice of the first quiet simmerings of indignation, of the first faint sounds of protest, of the scattered signs of resistance that in the midst of our despair portend the excitement of change. The isolated acts begin to join. The isolated thrusts blend into organized actions. And one day, often when the situation seems most hopeless, there bursts onto the scene a movement. Thank you for building the organization mm. and building the movement that will change this world. And thank you. Thank you so much for sharing with us tonight, this afternoon. Thank you for all your wisdom and experience. And I know that you're going off to do some other work right now. And um, I'm so gr very grateful for what you shared today. I wasn't able to catch it all, even as I listened to every word. I'll say that there's a recording of this that we can share and will be given out in a follow-up email. And I'm gonna, and there are more questions. I'm sorry we can't get to them all, but we'll let Heather go now. And for the rest of us, we are gonna take a five minute break. So it is three minutes after the hour. We'll be back at eight minutes after the hour. Leave your computer on, stand up, walk around, get something to drink. Don't forget to come back in five minutes oh. at eight minutes after the oh, hour. One thing, Lynn, sure. if people want to be on a list yes. that gives about a monthly email, mm -hmm. a little less frequent, of the movie, of both where it's being shown, but also actions you can take for that month. Great. You have your own actions, but it just suggests some things. Okay. If you give me the names of people who'd like to be on that list, email na email mm -hmm. list, I'll be glad to add. Great. Bye all. Thank, you, Thank so you for the work you're doing. I look forward to celebrating victories with you together. Thank you, Heather. Five minutes, everybody. <laughs>